9th CI went to a bioengineering regulatory workshop to see how we can get our meters classified as a medical device. We also went on a tour of the CAARS RF lab. We learned a lot about regulatory compliance, took some measurements of the media equipment they were using, and met some interesting people. Then we asked the really hard-hitting questions. Because for all the panelists here, is what are your thoughts on the combination of uh, lack of pre-market regulatory oversight um, and on energy exposure as a primary risk factor? Um, so I think the, 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 the question leads to basically, for example, we have lots of wireless energy transmitting devices across a wide frequency spectrum, but we have no long-term testing on the neuro or biocompatibility. So what's our candidate's uh, view on this? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, I don't know how, I can't speak for Health Canada, obviously. Uh, the lack of uh, evidence for the bio effects of all this radiation is outside the scope of what we can do. Right? It's up to the researchers and academics and uh, all the organizations out there to sort of generate this data. And it's very difficult. It's been I mean, this has been a problem for ever since you know radio. I guess well, not ever since it was invented, but ever since uh, we have become aware of the possible effects of when X-rays were first discovered. Uh, there was no concern at all as to the bioeffects of X-rays until you know, the research community as a whole, uh, I don't know where it started exactly, but, but I mean, until there was a realization that, hey, you know, every time you put your foot on that, you know, it's, uh, it's causing more and more damage. So it's very hard to say we have a stance because there's the evidence is lacking in the way. Uh, who's going to do it? I don't know. It's, it's beyond our medical devices bureau to, 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 to make a call. But once that evidence is out there and has been somehow uh, accepted, it is most definitely evidence that will be taken into consideration for uh, in our process. And uh, I mean, I'll just add that, you know, perhaps in, there's, in this particular space, there might be a lack of pre-market regulatory oversight. However, I mean, there is a post-market arm of uh, our regulatory framework. So if a problem was reported to Health Canada um, pertaining to this issue, then that would be investigated. And that could result in um, a risk communication, a guidance, a notice, um, work on standards, etc. So, I mean, there are mechanisms and neighbors in place that could eventually feed into additional regulatory controls. But I mean, it's important to note that the onus is on, as Patrick put it, um, academia, industry, etc., to present those flags and concerns to all the candidates. And, and to that point, I'd add, like it's, we often look to regulations to see what, what we can and cannot do or what's accepted. And we have to remember, I think, if, if you look at how things happen, Regulations are not the first thing to come out uh, before the, the regulations are not made preemptively. Right? They, they're often a, a result of what we see out there in the field. So if it's not out there, how can you regulate it? If, if that makes any sense. Yeah, just, just to add another um, thought to that. So there are some existing oversight, maybe not from Health Canada, but um, often, especially for devices that are electrical in nature and wireless communication, um, there are some EMC electromagnetic compatibility standards uh, and certifications that, that one can meet, and um, NEMCO sitting right there, they would be good to talk to about um, third-party testing related to electrical safety, electro uh, electromagnetic interference, and compatibility with other devices, and then there's other um, there's other governing bodies. Um, I'm thinking of the U.S. one, the federal, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, where they do um, some standards for for SAR, so that's um, specific absor absorption rate of um, energy into the, into the human body. So 
yes, it's outside of Canada, but the, the, it does exist and um, it's, it's available and you can get your devices tested to those standards. So, so follow up on this one, and you raised a good point regarding SAR. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put a, like a, an example out there where, for example, induction ovens. So we have induction ovens now in, in lots of the homes. They are based on uh, simple coils, but they're uh, basically with a high magnetic field, uh, mostly a sub-100 hertz. Um, uh, they're uh, quite efficient, so lots of people like them because they get your food cooked fast, and they're good in the electricity as well. But um, the magnetic field emitted from these is quite higher than what's deemed safe in uh, many other countries. Uh, for example, a typical induction oven can uh, emit about uh, 20 to 30, sometimes 40 microteslas. Uh, and that's when you're standing in front of it, while in many countries, uh, going beyond the 0.4 microtesla long-term exposure is considered a cancer hazard. Um, many of these induction ovens are available in the market here in, in Canada, but I'm pretty sure Health Canada is not involved in the process of approving the induction ovens, right? <laughs> uh, what would be the process of getting this? I know you said that Canada doesn't involve much into these things, but what is the proper sequence here or for a Canadian citizen to make sure that he's using something that's safe to his health or her health? I, I mean, <laughs> I might tackle that question from a bit of a different angle um, and talking about the opportunities um, to drive the development of regulation. Um, there are initiatives that are ongoing and will be forthcoming to modernize the regulatory framework for medical devices. And of course, through those initiatives, there will be touch points for consultation where industry and the general public will be able to weigh in and provide input. Um, and I think that is a really good mechanism to identify uh, some of these risks, some of these concerns, and have it dealt with in the appropriate pathway, which would be the development of the appropriate you know, regulatory controls to deal with it. Um, I mean, it might not address your specific question, but I think it is probably the best way to sort of drive the needle forward on some of these issues. So, um, also a follow-up on the SAR mentioned there. So SAR is, for those of you who don't know, SAR is basically a way to quantify the radiation coming from cell phones. And if it's beyond a certain level, these phones are not considered safe and they're not allowed to be on the market. Um, but if, if we want to form a similar uh, like regulatory uh, uh, limit, for example, for induction ovens, do you have a path in mind how Health Canada would handle something like this? Um, is there a process that Health Canada is looking at to incorporate down the, down the road, for example? I mean, not, I, not for that specific yeah. issue, but again, I mean, you know, there's new powers that are uh, offered in the, in the legislation to allow the minister to um, classify technologies as advanced therapeutic technologies. So that's one pathway where if it can enter into that pathway, then Health Canada has the opportunity to work with academia, and industry and other stakeholders to develop the appropriate regulatory controls, you know, in harmony with all the, you know, stakeholders um, for that given technology, for that given problem, what have you. And, you know, those regulatory controls can mature and evolve over time to the point where they can then enter the, the more structured regulatory framework um, and be, you know, put in place permanently. So, it's, I, I, I think it's through those types of pathways where some of these issues can be resolved. Um, moving to a second question. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that uh, there is a process to get, of course, the approval for uh, having a device labeled as a medical device. But does Health Canada, apart from all the documentation presented, do any measurements to verify what's listed in the reports? Do you take sample set of the product and? Uh, uh, investigate it in house to make sure that these reports are legit and there are actual numbers listed in there. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Patrick in a second, but I will say the simple answer to that is no. Currently, um, 
there's not a system in place to do that testing. Um, that previously did exist. Um, I mean, I think that dates back to maybe 2000 and um, was it 2012 around then, where some of the last labs that were still operating were, were shut down. Um, the regulatory review is really much on the data that's provided to, to Health Canada. But I'll, I'll bring you back to Patrick for comments. Uh, specifically, <clears throat> uh, within the Medical Bureau, no, there's no we don't. And so at first, I was surprised when I first sort of started with this whole relationship with Health Canada back then. Um, but you do get, I mean, you have to understand the scope of the problem to be able to do that, right? To take all the different types of devices that we see uh, and that we have to review and be able to conduct some sort of test to verify, to confirm the data that they're giving us. It's a, it's a huge undertaking. And we would love to be able to do that. I know my group would love to be able to do this. We're kind of trying to think of ways to be able to do some things uh, in the digital health area because, uh, I mean, software doesn't take a lot of bench space, right? So we're trying to think about it. Uh, and given the fact that, that our framework today has to be adapted, like, a, like I was trying to explain, uh, there might be some opportunities to do, to do some stuff. But this is, it's, it's, it's very hypothetical. There's nothing really uh, there, no. Uh, the, the, the review process is very much based on good faith. Uh, so we assume, we don't assume, I mean, we have no reason to believe uh, that you know, companies are lying to us. Uh, of course, we check. Uh, and as soon as flags go up, that's, that's uh, you know, we don't just, brush them off if we have any uh, concern regarding the data that's provided. And it happens very, very often. Uh, we will go in and check, yes, and we will definitely ask very specific questions and go after um, uh, any sort of doubt that we have. But we, we don't have in-house capability to do independent stuff yet. So if, if somebody uses facilities like the local public here and does say measurements on some of the devices on the field and finds out that they are not on, like uh, in compliance with some of the uh, EMC regulations or SAR regulations or whatever other regulations, what will be the proper channel to connect with our cameras? Like if, if, if there's any way, uh, I mean, the, again, depending on the type of device, but uh, I mean, I've looked at some devices where I had my concerns regarding regarding certain issues. Uh, we are, we will always go and seek independent data. We're not just going to rely on what the manufacturers are providing. Um, we have to be, you know, we have to do our due diligence. So we go out and research what else is out there. Um, if there's, if we happen to fall upon any type of application or any evidence that says, hey, you know, this type of device uh, can have this type of risk that, you know, it's not really well represented in the, in, in, in the submission of the application, we, are, we will completely jump on that uh, concern and use that evidence to go for further information uh, to the manufacturer. And I'll just add on. Um, there is a problem reporting mechanism through Health Camp as well. So if you do discover a particular issue with a with a medical device, you can report that to Health Canada, and then that will be investigated through our post market regulatory control arm. Um, and then, like Patrick said, you know different actions can be taken uh, to uh, you know find you know the root cause of the issue and then take uh, corrective steps. It, it, very quickly, if I can give you an example of how, uh, I mean, I have personally seen devices by accident on the market that sort of was, wait a minute, this is how, how this ever gets past us, right? Uh, as, as easy as that, and going back and going back to the manufacturer and saying, wait a minute, come, you know, we have the authority to be able to go back to the manufacturers and ask for more uh, information. 
information, and if they don't have it, or if there's a problem, we have the means of being, being able to uh, pull the license. Um, so um, another question is, uh, I think it's for Colin. You, you mentioned earlier that labeling um, to be submitted to Health Canada during licensing applications. Um, basically, can you confirm that this also includes uh, marketing material? If um, that's not, uh, it's not provided with the address. Yeah, labeling does include marketing material. The definition is uh, at the level of the act in terms of labeling, um, and it's fairly high level. I think it says something like any printed word or material in relation to the device that extends to, I guess, digitally printed, you know, websites, etc. So the promotional material, the marketing material, all certainly fits under that, uh, that definition. So how would you work with marketing material that's uh, been created after the, address, uh, the device has been registered? Uh, Again, I mean, if it's marketing material that's been created after uh, it's been licensed, and that marketing material ultimately changes the representation of the device in terms of the intended use, directions for use, etc., that notification would have to be provided to Health Canada through a, a, an amendment application. Um, if a company um, is maybe not being the most honest and they're trying to uh, include uh, more inflammatory sort of additional things within their marketing material that are outside the scope of the licensed device that, that was authorized by Health Canada, then again, that would be, uh, you know, presumably brought to our attention through some sort of problem report, etc. And then the following steps would be taken to correct that, uh, that issue, whether that's a labeling amendment, a license suspension, there's different regulatory controls in place that uh, would allow us to take action. Um, I just thought it was just a follow-up that as well from an industry perspective and I think this is when your regulatory affairs department or consultant becomes very important so as a small company or any, any size company um, if you're about to release a new uh, promotional material or anything of the sort that could fall under labeling um, you should have it integrated in your quality system where a regulatory person reviews and approves that material because they will look at it and scrutinize it from the perspective of a regulatory agency like Health Canada. So that, that would be highly recommended before releasing any kind of new material. So that's a plug for any of the RA people out there. <laughs> so if I can echo you, like from a reviewer's point of view, if the marketing information is not there, you will be asked for marketing information. It's not advisable to submit your application if you haven't had, if you haven't already uh, done your marketing material, because it's very. I, I can't give numbers, but it's it, it's very likely that you'll be asked for it, um, and if you don't have it, it that may cause you know, problems with the application process. So it's not very advisable if you're thinking from down that. So, so how would Health Canada address a case where? Um, for example, lots of devices that are being used at uh, physiotherapist clinics, for example, and they have been marketed for a given application, but they are being used for something else, and commonly used for something completely different. Um, would just uh, Health Canada uh, look the other way on these, or what's the typical? I mean, certainly not look the other way, but we also have to stay in our lane and, and follow our mandate. And I mean, as I touched on in my talk, under the regulations, uh, we're mandated to regulate the importation, sale, and advertising of sale, uh, sorry, advertising for sale of medical devices. And if they're being used off label, um, I'm, I'm no expert in this domain, but I mean, at the provincial territorial level, uh, there might be ramifications there. But um, federally, through our Health Canada regulatory program, it's not in our jurisdiction. That's all for today for us here at 9CI. Thanks for clicking. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Instagram.